Good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, welcome to the uh, Berkman Klein Center event series. Um, my name is Dan Jones. I'm with the Berkman Klein Center. And before we get started, I just wanted to flag a couple upcoming events. Um, next week is the wrap up of our 2018-2019 or event series. We have on Monday, we're uh, helping with the book launch for uh, David Kay's book, Speech Police, that will be at the Cambridge Public Library on Monday night. The next day, we have Christo Wilson uh, speaking about auditing for bias and resume search engines right here at lunchtime on Tuesday. And then that evening, we'll be helping with the launch of Mary Gray's new book, Ghost Work, um, that will be at the Harvard Bookstore. Um, you can find out more about all those events and RSVP on our website, cyber.harvard.edu. And um, we hope to see you at some of those events. Um, I'll mention one more thing for housekeeping. This event is being live streamed and archived on video and audio. So be aware that your uh, voice and visage will be <laughs> retained for posterity on the internet, um, especially when we get to question time. Um, without further ado, I wanted to uh, turn over to David Weinberger and Joey Ito. Thank you. Go and I go. Oh, maybe I can turn that. Hey. Yeah. So I'll start with David and I go way back um, to the early days of blogging when most of the bloggers knew each other. And we would link and we were coming up with trackbacks. And then, sort of, corporate, because uh, it's mostly America, corporate America figured it out and started to try to turn the blogosphere into sort of a corporate marketing machine. And David and a, a few of his pals got together and wrote this thing called the Clue Train Manifesto, which was a, a bunch of the bloggers trying to explain to these marketing people that the web was, this thing was about conversations. It wasn't about marketing. It wasn't about any of these paradigms that they had before. It had a huge impact on me and I think the blogosphere. And it was a very prescient uh, document that even when I go back today, um, I wish that uh, more people had adhered to that. Um, um, and then um, he uh, wrote a uh, book, another great book called Small Pieces Loosely Joined. You will start to see that his uh, book titles start to become sort of um, really great images on themselves. But I, a lot of people just read the book title and figure that that's all they need to read. But actually, the book goes on to, because um, um, Small Pieces Loosely Joined is kind of how I imagine the web. But the book is really about how the web is kind of a weird place and why do we feel uh, comfortable there. Um, the other, uh, the next book, which was also a, a wonderful book, is um, Everything is Miscellaneous, which again, very great title. It, you can be kind of reductionist and sort of, oh, okay, I get that, what that means. But it actually um, was a lot more about how the world gets, once it's knocked in um, a, a bazillion pieces, how do we think about how, that, um, how to order that. And then uh, Too Big to Know, again, another book where you could, oh, okay, I get that, what that book probably means. But it was really about um, how um, knowledge is uh, moving from books to networks. And I think, well, did you do this when you were at the library? Yeah, so this is really kind of, I think, inspired by some of the work at the library. And I think Everyday Chaos is also inspired by some of the open library work that um, David did. And I'm not going to give this one away because he's going to talk about Everyday Chaos. And it's not, and again, Everyday Chaos sounds a little bit pedestrian, but it's, um, far from pedestrian, and it's quite deep and maybe controversial to some. So I'll let uh, David present some of his views, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, thank you, Joey. I think I need to turn on my microphone. Thanks, Joey. Um, that, that was actually a remarkably good, uh, incredibly brief summation of a series of books. So uh, thank you. Um, uh, so. Uh, uh, I, first of all, I have a question. And first, I have a statement. Thank you very much for coming out. The question is, um, and nothing's going to, this is a sense of the room, that's all. How many of you, one way or another, work in the, are machine learning researchers or are in some way in that field? Uh, a smattering. That's, um, when in doubt, you probably should raise your hand for that. Um, and. How, uh, among the rest of you, how many of you feel like you have at least some sense of machine learning? You've been following some of what's going on. So raise your hands there. That's at least half, and I suspect that a bunch of you are 
not putting up your hands because you're afraid I'm going to cold call you and ask you to prove it, which I was contemplating to tell you the truth, but I, I won't. Okay, so um, this, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna, this is the first time I've given this book talk. It means a lot to me that it's being done at the Berkman Center, Berkman Klein, excuse me, Berkman, I'm showing my age, the Berkman Klein Center, um, where I've been a fellow or something um, for about 15 years and feels very much like my intellectual home. Um, so I'm gonna tell you as, uh, I'm gonna tell you about the book as basically as quickly as I can, but it's gonna be longer than you want so that Joey and I can talk and then we all can talk. Um, so, and I want to begin with a warning. The warning is that I, I am actually going to say positive things about the internet and positive things about AI. I understand that there are some negative things going on on the net and that there are deep and important issues uh, pr uh, around bias and fairness and other such really crucial things um, when it comes to AI. The book talks about especially the issues around AI. It, it tries to make sure that readers know that these are really real and pressing problems, but it's not about those issues. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is I think, overall quite positive, even though it's sort of uh, unusual, I think, these days to be positive about <clears throat> AI, much less the internet. So th the book isn't about those problems. There are wonderful books and research being done at the Berkman Center, at the media, MIT Media Lab, where, which Joey is the head of, and other places. The book is about, uh, it has an, an hypothesis, which is the future has changed, which does, by which I do not mean that the things of the future are changing, because that, that's always the case. This is the hyperloop as of 1912. But rather, the book um, wants to uh, explore the idea that our idea about how the future happens has changed. Not the con content, but the way that the future works. Um, there are seats if you, want to, if you want to sit down. Or you can stand. It's really up to you. Really none of my business when you come right down to it. Um, so this is the premise of the book. How we think the future happens has changed. And one of the ways of thinking about um, our idea of the future in an informal way um, and this, by the way, the domain is in the West, is that we sometimes think about the future as this broad field of possibilities. Um, it's our job, we think, to figure out which of those possibilities we want. And then we know that as those possibilities come towards us, as the future comes towards us, that the possibilities start falling away until there's only one left. And if you've done things right, then you win. You get the possibility that you wanted. But the basic motion of the future is that of narrowing of possibilities. And so our basic strategy has been to anticipate those changes and to prepare for them, to try to move the future in our direction. Um, and this obviously works very, very well. There's a tremendous price that we pay for the anticipate and prepare uh, strategy. But we don't notice it because we've been doing it literally since Paleolithic, since the first times we started flinting an ax in preparation for the next day, anticipating that we would need it the next day. So we've been doing this a long time. The, the costs of this, this strategy are enormous. We end up um, over-preparing, mis-preparing, under-preparing, and we take that for granted because that's just the way it is. We will continue doing this. I'm, uh, the, the book and I, uh, I'm not arguing that we're going to give up on anticipating the future because if you did that, the next bus would hit you because you wouldn't look both ways before crossing the street. So we absolutely we're going to continue doing this, but we are also now doing other things that may be uh, shaping our fundamental idea of how the future works. So um, I want to look at two big segments, um, as the book does. And one is things that are happening on the net that I believe have already conditioned us to accept that the future happens far more chaotically than we used to think. And second of all, that AI is, has come along and is now giving us, now that we've gotten used to this sort of chaos, AI is giving us a model by which we can start to understand it. There are still seats. I feel bad watching you stand. But you can if you want to, of course. Um, OK, so that's the basic structure 
of the book and also uh, very, very much so of this talk. So let's start with the net. I'm going to try to go as fast as I can because you are, one way or another, you are Berkman Klein compatible people. And I, I don't want to, uh, I assume that, and I'm certain that most of you are very well versed in what's going on on the net. So the net is letting us succeed in a chaotic environment. And for all the problems of the net, we still go on the net. We still get stuff done. I think we all would acknowledge that it's transformed almost every aspect of our lives, mainly for the, the better, but in some ways horribly as well. We are basically succeeding with chaos on the internet. And so we end up in this chaotic, weird environment that is the internet, um, doing weird things that we don't even notice are weird anymore because we've gotten used to them. But I think there's a thread connecting a whole bunch of them. And so I wanna, I'm going to point to two connected threads here and give you just one example really briefly of each of them. So the first example is minimum viable products. How many of you are familiar, I'm not going to call on you, familiar with the concept of the MVP? About half, OK. Um, so these, you are all probably using something that started out as an MVP. An MVP is a product that gets launched on the net, um, almost always, that provides only the barest minimum of functionality that people will pay for. So if it's Dropbox, it's you can use your files anywhere. That's pretty important functionality, but that's all that it started with, basically. And then over time, you watch what users actually do with your product, what they complain about, what they're talking with one another about, what they, what they want from it. You, you measure when you can how they're actually using it, and that gives you a really solid sense of what they want and need, and you start building up the features. This is a very successful strategy. It is a very new strategy, and it's entirely and antithetical to the most basic assumptions we've had about product design, which is you get to design a product and launch it once, and that's it, and so you better get it right. And the prototype of this is the Model T from Henry Ford, 1908, that they sold 15 million copies. We don't say copies. That's an online thing. 15, 15 million of these Model Ts over the course of 19 years with basically making no changes to it because Henry Ford anticipated users' needs so well that they didn't have to make any changes. That is the model of design by anticipation. Minimum viable product is an example of something thoroughly different. It purposely holds off from anticipating what people will want from the product and do with the product. It is holding possibilities open rather than trying to select the one right path. And it's not just MVPs. There's a whole range of things, um, agile development, uh, on demand from even before the rise of the internet, on demand manufacturing, um, unconferences, which some of you are familiar with, but where the agenda is not written before the conference, the agenda is written by the people who are attending it when they get there. No anticipation of what people are going to want to talk about. Unconferences are awesome, by the way. Um, so these are all examples. They're, they're thoroughly weird. We take them for granted. They are all ways of holding off from, anticip from anticipating and holding po possibilities open. Second example, slight change from, uh, uh, from that theme, are open platforms or open APIs, application programming interfaces, which is um, when a company has a, a product, they're selling it the way they sell products, um, they may well also these days open up a platform that enables any developer who has access to the web to use some of the functionality built into that product, maybe even some of the data, we hope carefully anonymized and privacy is preserved, to build extensions to that product, to change the way that it works so it suits their needs or the niche needs of, of users, to integrate it into other products, into their workflow. The company purposefully holds back. The company builds the product that they think is going to be successful, and they add on to it uh, over time. But they also open up these platforms because they recognize, the company recognizes, that it cannot anticipate all the uses to which this product might, might be put. All of the niche, niche uses, for example, which even if they recognize, they couldn't afford to build. Um, Slack, which is a well-known messaging app, is just one example of this. It's a little noteworthy because they actually um, uh, created an $80 million fund to actively encourage people to build these applications that integrate Slack into other products so it becomes part of the workflow. Open platforms, excuse me, they don't just hold open possibilities, they make more possibilities possible. You can do more things. And companies go to some expense to do this. And it's not just an open platforms, it's also games, 
Um, computer games have been doing this since the early 1980s. Uh, open source, open access. Um, these are all ways of en enabling more possibilities to be made. And I want to make uh, just call out one particular um, way of doing this, which is interoperability. Those two people wrote a pretty good book about it. Uh, they are Berkman Klein folks. A book called Interop. Interoperability is when a product, a, a part of a system designed for that system is also capable of being used in other systems w in unanticipated ways. Um, this makes every piece of what you build uh, generative. That is, it can create new stuff. It can be used to put together new stuff. He also wrote a pretty good book that talks about generativity. Um, uh, the end of the... <laughs> The future of the internet and how to stop it. Sorry. Thank you, Joey. Um, uh, Jonathan Zittrain, um, who is also sort of Berkman Klein connected, I believe. So interoperability is especially important because uh, not only does it, is it generative, but it is at the heart of the very heart and essence of the internet, which, if nothing else, is a way of making information interoperable. You can send it anywhere and do anything you want with it. The internet is an interoperable system. Um, so all these things, far from anticipating and trying to, to narrow the, the, the possibilities, both of these types of things um, tr try to make more possibilities. Um, the fact is that if anticipation is not just paleolithic, it's actually also reductive. It's a way of, of reducing the possibilities. Uh, this guy has written a really important essay in now a book called um, Resisting Reduction. Um, this is the move away from anticipation as a form of narrowing. Um, I, think is, I think we're moving in many ways. We have already moved to various forms of unanticipation, purposefully holding back um, our expectations for the future and trying to open up more of them. In fact, one could say that it seems as if that for the past 25 years, the globe has been involved in a worldwide attempt to to make the world more and more unpredictable, as if that was on purpose. And I think it absolutely was on purpose. It is on purpose. That is exactly what we've been doing for 25 years. Everything we can to make the world more unpredictable. Which means we are, in effect, reversing the flow of the future. It's not time travel, but rather than seeing it as a narrowing, we now also frequently bend our efforts in order to open it up. And so. One might say that, the, that the, the imperative has become in companies, in other organizations, in our individual lives, in our social groups, to make more future. So if the internet, so that's part one. If the internet has changed our, our, our practice in ways that affect how we think the future works, then AI is reframing it. And this is the hypothesis of the book. Um, and when I say AI, I mean, as I think many people do these days, they actually mean machine learning. Um, so I'm going to try to explain machine learning in a moment. <laughs> um, but let me tell you one of the, the, the premises going forward, which is if it is the case that we understand ourselves through our technology, and we have done this historically, and I think pretty clearly it has. So we only started feeling, feeling under pressure and like we need to let off steam during the steam age. And very rapidly in the 1950s, at the beginning of the information age, we suddenly felt, we experienced information overload. We could feel the information tingling through us and feeling made dizzy by it. We worried about it. It was a thing. We, we think of ourselves, we get sort of stuck, and we say, well, wait, I'm processing, I'm processing, as if your brain were a computer. We understand ourselves through our tools, especially the tools that we, we name an age after, like the age of information or the steam age. I'm willing to, I don't make predictions, but I think I'm about to. Um, it seems pretty clear to me that we are now at the beginning of the age of AI or maybe the age of machine learning. I don't know what it's going to be called, but this is, this is an epical technology, machine learning. And if this is that, if we are now entering, if that's going to be the dominant technology, um, and if it's the case that we understand ourselves through our dominant technology, then maybe we can start to ask, OK, well, then what will the world, or what does already the world, begin to look like if we start understanding ourselves and our world through the model of machine learning, just as we have with 
information and with steam and with clockworks, et cetera. And that's actually what's behind much of this book. So I'm going to try to give you the world's fastest explanation of machine learning. Those of you who are in the field, please refrain from catcalling. Uh, this is, I know I'm getting this wrong. I am not a computer scientist. I'm a writer. So I am certainly going to get this wrong. So um, traditionally, um, and including in traditional programming, so let's take traditional programming, we, we like to start with a conceptual model. So if you are working on a program for um, predicting sales for your business, you will first think about what are the factors that affect sales, and then what are the relationships among those. So certainly the number of salespeople very likely affects sales. More salespeople, maybe more sales, but that also has an effect on costs, and it's going to drive up maybe the cost of your support customer support and uh, do you have enough leads, what's the relationship there, and maybe you need to increase marketing, get more leads, et cetera. So you have a set of the factors that affect it and how they interact, and then you, that's the conceptual model, then you write a, a working model in software that instantiates that. And if what I just described sounds like a spreadsheet, uh, absolutely, that's what a spreadsheet is. It's a really easy way of programming a computer, and it's exactly what you do. Here are the factors, here are the relationships, the formulas, the equations that connect them. And obviously, this works really, really well. Machine learning doesn't do that. Machine learning takes the data, but throws out, largely throws out, the set of relationships among the pieces that we humans think are, are there. You take the data, you strip all meaning. Uh, I'm sorry, I should say, we like it when our conceptual model and our working model um, are the same. In our history, we don't always achieve that. But when we do, we really, really like it for, I think, good reasons. This is a case in machine learning where we just sort of throw out the conceptual model. And throw out's too strong. You can argue, you know, but basically, we throw out the conceptual model. We take the data. We take the categories that we're in. We put them into these buckets. And then we let the machine do its statistical magic work, iterate and iterate and iterate, finding statistical relationships, correlations among the pieces of data. Uh, without having any idea about how things go together and which things are causal and all of that. Just here are correlations among what can be millions of data points connected multiply, a thousand, one to a thousand, more or less, depending on the sort of, of neural network that you're building. And you end up, and those relationships that you're drawing, that the machine is drawing, excuse me, um, have weights, um, sort of uh, um, the predictability of the, uh, the likelihood of those weights, those relationships, Actual, doesn't matter. The relationships have weights. You get this enormously complex network, which does not look anything like this. It's a conceptual, artist uh, conceptualization of it, in which lots and lots of particular points are connected to lots and lots of particular points. And these things, when you put in the data, you want to know, OK, fine, this is, let me see what the sales projections are going to be. You put in the data, and out comes, out comes results. And we use these. They don't always work. But we use them because often they do work. They give us more accurate predictions or faster predictions um, or better classifications, more accurate than we could do. Uh, they're doing things either faster, better, or cheaper than we can. And these things are things that we think of as ca cognitive activities. Every day, I mean literally every day, there are new applications of this technology. Many of them weird and surprising, but they work. And many of them, at least initially, we don't know why they work. There are too many connections. If you sat down and you tried to figure out how, where the different points connect to, you would spend years following meaningless data points, and you would come out of it still not knowing how it worked. In some instances, you certainly can, there are generalizations, and you can begin to see how it works. And there's lots and lots of great work being done in order to make these systems more explicable. But as it stands right now, we use systems not all of them, but we use some of the systems that we use, we simply cannot understand. We don't, and people look at them and examine them and are just, I don't see why. I don't get it. But they work. That is, uh, that's, that's a surprise in our history. We have these things work. We use them. We're getting tremendous benefit. We are at the beginning of a spurt of, of innovation, um, but it's, comes at a price. It's a wrenching change. It is giving us a new model of models, which for me if, and for the book is the important and interesting thing. The types of models that it builds 
are different from the sorts of models that we build for ourselves. The sorts of models that we traditionally build for ourselves are old meaning now. We like it when, they, when we have general principles. We can say, OK, here's the general principle about how a business works or how anything that we're modeling works. Here are the general principles. We can apply particulars to it. We can explain particulars by looking at the general principles. We can predict on that basis. Those general principles are understandable. Uh, we understand them. That's how we use them. And at least a part of us says, it's the general principles. That's where the truth is. That's the truth. The rest of it is just sort of data. It's transient. You feed it in. The permanent truth, that's in the principles. In these, in these new models, it's really not like that. It, it's a connection of particulars. These particulars are connected complexly and densely and delicately. So a small change in one of them can cause a gigantic change, a, a ripple effect, a butterfly effect, if you will. And at least some of them we don't understand. And there's controversy about whether that is a you know, whether we can get to the point where we, we, where we will always understand these. Right now, we're not. So I want to look at, at th some things that change. This is very, I'm going to warn you, this is very speculative. Um, but um, if that's the case, if we're going to start understanding ourselves in terms of those models, here are maybe some things that uh, will change or are already changing. We, begin, we can begin to see the change already. The first is strategy. So strategy is a pretty new thing in the world um, in the way that we think about it. So military strategy is really a 19th century invention. And business strategy, it's, you're talking decades here. Um, you need, in order to have an idea of military strategy and be able to write books about it and teach it and, and uh, fight battles using it, you have to have an idea that it's a fairly stable system, stable enough that there are some general laws. And they're not as stable as Newton's laws of you know, gravity. But nevertheless, there are some general principles we can start to know and educate ourselves on that are, are stable and law-like, and we can understand them. Our experience on the net says, well, you know, life maybe isn't quite like that. In the past 10 or 15 years, the idea of business strategy, which, as I say, is already, already a pretty new idea, has come under very potent and heavy fire criticism. Um, so a book like The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, very important book, basically says that you know, your strategy is very likely to can be disrupted at any moment by things beyond your control. Black Swan shows up, uh, falls on your head, and crushes your business, crushes your, your, your supply chain. You never know. The strategy is not as stable as we thought. The only thing that's surprising to me is that we needed to hear this because it seems, but we did. And it's having, this book is a very important business book within, within the world of business. And likewise, uh, Rita Gunther McGrath um, is among the people who is saying, ah, be careful of committing to large scale strategies because there's so much change. If you, Pay attention to the small changes around you. Look for opportunities and risks. Try to address them early. Um, some people have started call calling this a type of approach, being wary of big, thunderous strategies, uh, minimum viable strategy. I actually thought I invented that, and then I Googled it. And I did not invent that term, but I like it. Um, this also, I think, helps explain why we hear such ridiculous terms from the, the valley that we all find ridiculous, like um, disruption and pivoting and uh, run fast and break things. Uh, so I'm not advocating for the language. Nevertheless, the fact that this is the language of the valley tells us something about the nature of strategy, that it has changed. That these things can be talked about as strategy is really, really weird. and indicates, perhaps, that we are moving away from this a little bit. I just want, this is inessential, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so Plato is the first one who explicitly distinguishes strategy from, from tactics. And what he means by tactics is what we pretty much would call logistics. What he means by strategy, the, the go-to example, the analogy that he uses in order to explain this in the first instance, are musicians who are making up tunes. It's improvisation. Not exactly our idea of strategy. But I think we're seeing indications that we actually are going back to that notion of strategy. So the second thing that maybe changes 
uh, that we may already see changing is decision making, where our model has been, our image has been, well, you're at a crossroads. You've got two choices to make, which is hugely reductive. Um, or maybe it's five, or you have 10 options. But you've, narrow, you've already done the work of narrowing your, the future down to a literal handful of options. And then in a, in a large environment, the person at the top uh, makes a decision. And we consider that, to, that activity to be fairly, to be quite heroic. There are no spoilers here, OK? It's just Jon Snow, no comment. But it's a heroic activity. We know that corporate hierarchies in the middle of the 19th century were invented one of the explicit reasons they were invented was to limit the flow of information. Because the person at the top of a large corporation can't know everything. And so you need a set of lieutenants who will reduce at each step the amount of information. And they're, they're competent, and they reduce, reduce it to what one person can decide. And you know that's, that's, um, that works if you think that decisions are best made by reducing and throwing out as much information as you possibly can. These days, you know. When the web started and we, people were worried about uh, information overload, I mean, that was, that was the topic for like 15 years, from, from the, you know, the middle of the 1990s to oh, at least the beginnings, the, the early 2000s. This was the topic. Information overload is going to destroy us. And I, I don't know about you. I have not heard anybody complain about information overload in, I'm going to say, a few years. I hear other complaints all the time about information, um, that, it's, that people aren't getting the right information. There's fake news. These are serious issues, of course. But the desire that I see all around me is people who feel like they're not getting enough information. I think we have gotten acculturated to what we used to think of as information overload, which I'm going to say I think has an effect and is, is actually a healthy thing. So if you want to make. If it's the case that um, we need as much information as we can so that we can make smaller scale decisions, st st uh, strategic decisions, then the same is true for, for decision making. Well, in fact, I was just redundant. So we see people who, organizations that are moving uh, consciously towards distributed decision making, where the local expert gets to make the decision because she's the one who knows the most. That's what makes her the local expert. And if the local expert can't decide, then you escalate it. Um, and you keep escalating it if you have to until you get to the top. And so this is very much the Wikipedia model. So I'll use the, you know, the founder as the example. Um, where'd he go? OK, there he is. Uh, Jimmy Wales, who has said that by the time a decision gets to him, if it works its way, its way up the Wikipedia hierarchy, and Wikipedia absolutely has a hierarchy, then that means the, the entire community was unable to resolve this question. And if that community unable to resolve it, it's very likely because it's not a resolvable question. The two sides are equally, uh, the pro and the con are equally balanced. And so Whale says that in most instances, when, he, when it gets to him, it means his job is simply to toss a coin. Because he is not a local expert. He does not know as much about 18th century French literature as the local expert does. So by the time it gets to him, coin toss. And this guy has said something very similar. similar. That often when the decision gets to him, it's gone up through a, 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 an administration of experts. Very likely, it's just there is, there's no way to decide. So that's not always the case. I'm sorry, I don't mean to say presidents always flip the coin. Sometimes wish that was the case, because then 50% of the time, we'd be getting good results. But sometimes that is the case. And it takes a certain modesty as a leader to, to say that. It's, it's not heroic to be the coin flipper even though that's exactly, in some instances, what you should be. OK, the next thing that changes is your explanation. So let's say you are on a back road. You're driving. You get a flat. You want to know what happened. You look. And yep, OK, there it is, nail. That's a really good explanation of a flat. But it's a particular type of explanation. Um, it's a very common type, which is a sine qua non, which is a there but for the nail. Uh, except for the nail, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. Perfectly good explanation. I'm not arguing against it. All I want to say is it's not the only sine qua non in this situation. Because you were on that road because you were late and it was a shortcut. If you hadn't been late, you wouldn't have hit the nail. If you hadn't swerved to miss the bunny, you wouldn't have gotten hit the nail. If metal were softer than rubber, you wouldn't have gotten a flat. If pointy things didn't penetrate better, you wouldn't have gotten the flat. 
If we didn't care about going places fast, you wouldn't have gotten it. If we didn't care about this in an economy, a capitalist economy, economy which will serve our needs a particular way, we wouldn't have gotten the flat. If gravity were in an effect, you would not have gotten the flat. And if space aliens had finally arrived and, and vacuumed up all of the surface metal because they are a rust-based metabolism, you would not have gotten the flat. All of these are sine qua nons. Everything is a sine qua non. Everything had to happen for you to get that flat. But we look at the, at the nail and we say, that's the explanation. Why? It's a really simple answer. It's a really, there's a really good answer to this as well. The nail is the explanation because in that scenario, it's the only thing you can change. You can't get rid of gravity. You can't go back in time and say, OK, I'm going to run over the bunny uh, and not get the flat. You can't do those things, nor should you. But you can take the nail out. And so that becomes the explanation. But it's good. I'm not arguing, of course I'm not arguing against this. All that I'm saying is that explanations are tools. They are not always the best tool, despite what some regulators seem to, to think. And they always hide more than they reveal. And I'm going to, I'm pretty sure I'm going to regret saying always, because you should always regret saying always. But I'm going to stick with it. This type of explanation hides more than it reveals. It's fine. It's a tool. It's what we need from it. But if we are now in a position, thanks to the new sorts of models that we're experiencing, thanks to our life on the internet where we are in this chaotic environment, if we are coming to, ex to accept inexplicability, not as an exception, not as a flaw, but as a part of the landscape. And not as a, it's not a failure to understand. We understand through explanations that hide more than they make clear. If we get used to inexplicability as a part of the landscape, then we are headed for disruption on a Copernican scale, as I think we are. Because Western culture, and you remember, I scoped this only to the West. Western culture begins with a covenant, a covenant that says humans are the special creatures that are able to understand their world to some degree. Uh, in one tradition, it's that God made us in his, sorry, his, we'll talk about that later, uh, in his image, by which nobody means God looks like a person, but rather that we are made as creatures who are able to appreciate, understand and appreciate some of God's creation. In the Greek tradition, the same word that names the, the order and the beauty of the cosmos Logos is the word for the human ability to apprehend that beauty and order. This has been fundamental to our, our idea of who we are and what our, why we're here. I mean, there's no point in being the rational animals if the world isn't rational. But our experience of the internet, our increasing reliance on in inexplicable models, uh, models that don't rely upon general principles, that connect particulars to particulars, and may not yield general principles, or may not yield general principles that humans can understand. That breaks the covenant. It says that this technology is thinking, uh, it doesn't think at all, right? So heavy air quotes on this, but is, is thinking about the world differently than we are, and we're using it because it is thinking better, at least in those instances, for those purposes, uh, than we are. Maybe our thinking is, is a tool. We've known this for a long time. We've, we've, it is, this is not news, but it's coming to prominence because now our machines are letting us succeed with inexplicability. It's at the heart. In some way, I don't want to say that because I'll get in trouble, but many, the complexity of these models, their particularity is at the heart of the model. And the, those two things do not yield themselves easily to human thought. It may be that the world is more chaotic than we have thought, and now we can see that because we've succeeded at it on the net and because we have technology that enables us to make predictions and classify and do stuff like that. Um, but it's maybe less like our understanding than we thought. The universe does not owe us an explanation. And if it did, if it gave us one, we couldn't understand it. We may be less at home in the, in the universe than we were able to acknowledged before. That is, I think, it's a scary prospect. And it has dangers, for sure. But I also 
in my heart, I think it's an evolutionary step. I think it's a step forward for us. It's a step towards maturity as a species to be able to recognize that. We can, um, it's very painful. It's a painful transition uh, for sure and a dangerous one because we, we are going wrong in many ways and will continue to. Um, we're just at the beginning of it though. And I think that it is actually a way closer to truth um, and to the humility that comes with awe. Thanks. Thank you, David. So, so that was my 20 minute talk. <laughs> so um, this, this morning, as I was thinking about this talk, I was Googling around and I read a paper called Explanation as Orgasm by Alison Gopnik. Okay, and for those of you who haven't read it, um, basically it's a, she, she's a developmental psychologist, neuroscientist, and she says that um, as we have orgasms to induce us to reproduce, we have this orgasmic love of epiphanies, of explanation that induces us to learn. And so the reason little babies have joy when they have something unexpected happen and laugh is just because it forces us, it's a, it's a hard wiring uh, to induce us to learn and it's the desire for explanation at the level that we desire reproduction and it's hard wired. So, so, so either your explanation has to give us a lifetime's worth of orgasmic epiphany that we will never have explanations or you are going to deprive us of orgasmic explanations. But, 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 but to, to turn this into a question. That is an awesome choice. I need to think about it. <laughs> but, 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 but sort of, I think we've talked about sort of different responses that people have, but, but just, so I, in my book, I had this principle, um, practice over theory. And my faculty peers hated it, right? They said, no, no, it should be the opposite, theory over practice. Are you calling for the end of theory? Is that it? No, just the end of orgasms. <laughs> so I think that should be okay. Uh, um, no. And before I respond, I'll, yeah. no, um, I don't want to respond to the first part too, yeah, if you want. Oh, or, this or, really or something else, I, yeah. Um, there's a connection between explanations and humor and the joy of both that uh -huh. um, is ripe for exploration. I have not read, so I haven't read the orgasm piece. And I, yeah. I don't want to um, comment on it in any serious way. So just sort of yeah. cheap shots expressing my discomfort with the entire concept. Yeah. Um, although I think it sounds pretty good. Um, so no, I'm not calling for the end of theory. Um, I like science. Uh, all anti-vaxxers, raise your hand and then leave. Um, I like science. Um, and I want more of it. I want evidence-based argument. Um, but, so it's gotta, you know. Um, we, we do, we live in a world that's, we, that is, we think we, we live in um, a rule-based universe, and we do. I'm not gonna, I have no intention of arguing with Newton, right, mm -hmm. uh, or any other people proposing well-documented um, universal laws. Um, so we think about the world as consisting of, uh, the, the reality is in those principles, but then we get up and we go to work, and um, we cross the street, and there is, even in this rule-based world, we have no way of knowing that there's gonna be a candy bar wrapper over here and somebody wearing a Beyonce t-shirt over there and that there's a, a red car with one light out and that we're gonna miss the light and we're gonna to get to work and the coffee's gonna be warm or hot or cold or the canister is broken or our, our coworkers borrowed our cup and forgot to wash it and, and she's wearing mismatched socks and, or whatever. Everything in our lives, everything in this room mm -hmm. is an accident in that regard. It, but that's it, not necessarily new, right? No, it's not no, new. No, okay. We have invested, so I'll get to the new part, right? Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Um, we have, in the West, sort of meso metaphysically invested reality in what's permanent and real, which the universal laws that we are remarkably able to discover, um, that's, those are the real things. Mm -hmm. All that I'm suggesting is that if our experience on the net of succeeding with chaos and cherishing chaos, mm -hmm. and if we now have a model that in some way instantiates that, it doesn't start with rules, it may not, uh, may not yield rules, but it takes individual pieces and connects them in mm -hmm. statistically useful ways, we hope. Um, if that becomes the model of how the world works and how the future happens, mm -hmm. then maybe we can, um, instead of saying mere accidents, mm -hmm. 
real laws, mere accidents. Nobody ever says mere laws, mere universal laws. There's a value judgment. There's a metaphysical value judgment where we have preferred the eternal and the permanent and the laws um, over the experience of our own lives. And if we are able, if, if these changes enable us to um, change that weighting some, not disinvesting from the importance of universal laws of when we can find them, it's fantastic, but uh, give more validity and importance to the accidents, mm -hmm. the contingencies, the dust of our own lives, mm -hmm. then that's a change. So, so I do buy the importance of accidents. I mean, th I think there's a number of scholarly <coughs> studies about uh, innovation discovery that the majority of interesting things are discovered while looking for something else. So I think serendipity makes sense. Um, but sort of the question, sort of getting back to kind of like how we live our lives, right? Because, um, and this gets back to the orgasm thing, which is, I have a two-year-old. And, and another thing that Allison describes is that the number of hypotheses tested per minute by a infant is higher than research scientists, right? And so what's interesting is our lives are continuously hypothesize, test, learn. And, and that loop happens because of the love of epiphany, right? But, but, but you're not saying to give up on that. A-B testing, in a way, is that, right? Yeah, so, 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 uh, yes. And, and, and our addiction with causal explanations, although you kind of tease the causal part, is it about the, 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 the timeline and the grandeur of the stuff that becomes, because at a micro level, you're, you, you, you agree that learning, or do you agree, agree that learning comes from causal, testing causal hypotheses? That's certainly a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and, I, I, okay, keep going. Yeah, and, and so, so, so I guess, is, is it a time scale thing? Because I think like strategy, even if it's very short, Right, um, like, like, you know, like minute by minute, and that's what a lot of Silicon Valley is. Is is it still strategic, but it's strategic at a much more uh, fast clock speed, or is that not the way you would frame it? Well, so I, let's come yeah. back to that because I want to. Yeah. I mean, that's an important point too. Um, So uh, there may well be, uh, and I assume there are, reasons why the patterns that machine learning discovers are patterns. And mm -hmm. it's certainly the case that the confetti that falls on the Thanksgiving Day Parade, each piece is governed by, by uh, causal laws. Um, the testing of, so the reason why I sort of shrunk mm -hmm. for a moment on the testing of causal hypotheses, mm -hmm. although it's, that's fine, uh, um, is that we, there's, there's been a line of thought uh, um, over the past few decades that, you know, let's think about at least the past few de decades, let's assume that human thinking, human reason is not aimed at truth, but at evolutionary objectives. Mm -hmm. um, that we are optimized, so to speak, not for discovering truths, but for surviving, mm -hmm. for having lots of kids mm -hmm. who then will. Um, so the fact that a kid is testing lots of hypotheses doesn't necessarily mean that she's developing um, She's developing, she's developing statistical patterns about how things interoperate. Language itself, so there's a mix here, right? Uh, language itself, words are generalizations, right? Words are a single thing that cover instances in every case that are different mm -hmm. one way or another. Um, we can't survive without words. I am not suggesting that we go non-linguistically. Mm -hmm. Rather, I am suggesting that we may be in for an epical change in the broad strokes of how we think about how the world works. Mm -hmm. Certainly universal laws, we certainly want science to continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, did I terminally offend any anti-vaxxers? We certainly want science to continue. Um, we want more funding for it. Um, but what do we think that it's doing? What do we think that we are doing? So you can have, I think uh, Newton certainly knew this, um, I think all scientists do, except the ones who are going to disagree with me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, there are universal laws. The data is incredibly complex. Applying those universal laws to each little tiny piece of dust and piece of confetti mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is impossible. Mm -hmm. We just we take that for granted. That's mm -hmm. our condition. Mm -hmm. um, I am suggesting, I'm not disagreeing with that. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting that we take that more seriously, that we take more seriously uh, we, we say that and then we turn our attention back to the universal laws and say that's mm -hmm. what's real. Right. And we say, yeah, they're real, but so is the so, dust and the confetti. So is it like the miscellaneous thing where 
we, we focus on the stuff that we understand, but the majority of important stuff is unexplainable. Is that the way you would just yeah, say I mean, it's, that's, like a, it's, it's, yeah. it's a distribution? Um, and, yeah, and, and, yes. and, and, and I guess, you know, to put sort of my machine learning tussle hat on, um, my, my personal opinion is that there's a kind of, there's an interesting battle going on, I think, between the statistical correlation machine learning people and the emerging causal people, like um, Udaya Pearl's Why book, right? Where, I mean, there's a famous statistician. The Book of Why. Book of Why. Um, there's a famous statistician criminologist named Burke who said if sunspots and shoe size correlate with crime, we should use that data. And there's definitely a fairness issue. And then there is a, uh, a is, is correlation equivalent uh, to, to cause? And should we use correlation? I think the thing is that you get lazy. And I think machine learning is very good at making predictions based on correlation. And a lot of humans then stop because it's difficult to ask causal questions. And, 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 and I think you, you deal with causality a lot, uh, sine qua non in your book. Um, are, you, are you saying that, I guess the qu it's a sort of a nuance. And by the way, when you asked me to do this, you knew that I, I wasn't going to th saw you throw you softballs, right? <laughs> I will. <laughs> it's, um, so, so are you saying that we should give up? Are you saying that it's going to be harder? Are you saying that we should try hard? Uh, where, where are you on this kind of causal and counterfactual thing? I mean, do you think, are you, what, what are you telling us as, uh, as, a, as a community to, to how, how should we deal with causality? Uh, a simple little question. Um, so, first of all, I have I like I think every other, at least Westerner, uh, believes that underneath all of this, there's causality. If mm -hmm. if, um, if if there are correlations that keep holding and holding and holding, and are sort of more rigorously tested, and the, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, then maybe there's some causality we don't understand. It may be very indirect, mm -hmm. you know, um, between sunspots, shoe size, and crime. That seems mm -hmm. pretty unlikely, but you know. Um, it, I am not a computer scientist. From what I, from from what little I know, it sounds like, including the Pearl book, it sounds like there are good reasons to incorporate what we know about causality into um, into machine learning systems when mm -hmm. it makes sense. I mean, why why throw all of that out? Except that you can doing so can turn up uh, correlations that uh, strictly causal analysis um, mm -hmm. would would miss. So, um, so you're saying and. Yeah. Don't throw I, away the unexplainable, but not give up. Yeah, and, and yes, and you um, inserted quickly the fact that there are some ethical issues here as well, and mm -hmm. uh, I know that you know this very well, as many people in the room do. It, those are really, really serious. They're, you know, uh, the, those um, when you are arresting people of color because there's a statistical relationship between the sneakers they wear and you know whatever. You really have to do some careful thinking. In fact, you have to stop doing that. That's you know, pretty clear. So the ethical issues that, that ring this are actually central to how we, how we apply this stuff. Um, it has to be very, very careful. I, I would point out that there's an interesting um, sort of, um, I, I think it's, uh, I'm trying to remember his name now, um, um, Timothy Morton, uh, a philosopher, like you. I'm um, not a philosopher. You are? No, I'm not. Um, once a philosopher, always a philosopher. Nope. Uh, but, but, he, but he has this thing called object-oriented ontologies, and he's working with indigenous uh, communities because I think one of the th interesting things is that um, a lot of climate-related issues come from a very reductionist approach and understanding of climate. And indigenous communities tend to have a more nuanced and uh, a belief system where unexplainable but intuitively understood things are practiced. And, and there's, a, I think, an interesting movement to try to incorporate, whether it's talking about Eastern medicine or talking about the understanding of the climate by indigenous communities. So I think there's an interesting, uh, uh, among sort of, of uh, anthropologists and philosophers, uh, an approach to trying to bring the unexplainable in, into context. And, I, and, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I wonder, um, is, it, is it the, is it, I mean, have you thought about, and is it connected to, because I, I let, me, let me back up. I, I think that we've had a very reductionist period through the Industrial Revolution where we wanted all the Model Ts to look the same. We wanted organized, we wanted order. And now machine learning and um, internet has shown that the world is chaotic. But I think a lot of history and with nature, actually once you start to connect with it, 
or even just society. It turns out to be messy. And I think it was actually the engineers and the economists who kind of wanted to quantify everything. And if you think if you talk to the uh, humanities and the social scientists, they might argue that it's not. And the philosophers are often in service of the economists and uh, the engineers helping them justify with platitudes uh, the reduction. Um, sorry, I'm getting off on my own little tangent. So, but, 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 I, but I guess, have you, have you, do you think this is a new thing um, with computers and internet, or is it just re-understanding something that may have been around before we got into this sort of engineering yeah. mode? So, uh, when are the softball cuff questions coming? <laughs> no, no, those will come when I open it up. No, no, no they're not going to get um, softball. So I, there's been a tension for a long time um, between these two approaches. Uh, mm -hmm. One is what today we would call statistical, but even before you would note correlations between things uh, and, and note, cause, uh, note correlations. So the dog star appears, and you know that the Nile riverbanks are going to overflow. And you have no idea. You don't understand about gravity and the, why what causes the, you know, the tug of gravity causing the overflow. Um, but there's correlation, and it turns out to be causal underneath it. Um, and we accept it. It's sort of a statistical, simple statistical one. The founding fathers of the US, um, a bunch of them, used to track the weather every day, keep a weather log, without any theory about whether an early frost was uh, foretold by the withering of the you know, chrysanthemums or whatever. I'm pretty much making this up. Um, but they would note. Mm -hmm. This and then try to find correlations as going on for hundreds of years. It's only like right at the beginning of the 20th century that um, a, a, a model of the of the weather um, was formulated. That um, a guy whose name I never remember, Bjorkenis, I think. Anybody know? You can Google it later and correct me. Um, said, well, okay, well, you know what? Weather, atmosphere. Uh, it works on Newtonian principles, which we can understand. There are seven factors. There's moisture, speed, heat, whatever. You know, seven factors. We can use this and, and came up with a model that was law-based, re reductive in its, uh, and eventually worked. Initially, not so much. And the early computers took a full day, over a day, to calculate mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, results. At the same time that there were statistical models getting increasingly sophisticated. So this tension between the two has been going on for a long time in, under different names. Mm -hmm. It's only now that we have machines that are capable. So everything on the surface of the Earth affects weather. Mm -hmm. A little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, most of it you don't care about, but it affects it. Only now do we have the sensors that are able to gather enough data, and the machines are able to not just process the data, but to process it process it in its relatively chaotic form, looking for correlations that the seven principles, which now are more, of course, um, would miss entirely, mm -hmm. that we're getting results that we that you all know that your weather reports have gotten far more accurate and precise and longer term in the past few years than they have for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Well, for 100 years. There's been amazing progress in weather forecasting because it's machine learning now. We now have machines that are able to calculate and compute and connect um, more and more stuff in ways that we cannot understand frequently that are giving us better results. We are living in this world. Every time you use your phone, you're, you know, for you're reading your email, it's, the spam is machine learning. You, 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 the suggestions on your, on your music uh, system, the, um, the type ahead when you type, it's all machine, the, the routes that it's drawing for you, when, it's all machine learning. And in some instances, we don't know exactly how it's working, but it's working really well, well enough that we're not using the old tools. As, we be, as this begins to sink in, and we say, yeah, no, it's fine. We don't understand. We don't need to understand. The routing's working fine. I, I don't, it doesn't matter if we don't know how it works. The spam filters are amazing. I, we don't know why it's picking out the word beyond in connection with that, is there, but who cares? It's working. As this becomes the, and as our medical, we go in for medical treatment, and then I, we're not very far away at all um, from the doctor telling you, well, uh, you look pretty good. Everything's fine, except the, the machine learning system says that you're at risk of developing type 2 diabetes in five years. What do you want to do about it? 62% chance. And you say, what? You know, I don't need uh, exercise. I don't eat carbs. And the doctor said, well, you know, it's machine learning. We, uh, we can't tell you exactly in this case. Uh, but we do know we've, it's, yeah, it says 62. It's a 62% chance. And you're going to do something about it or not. And we're going we're to be faced with this over and over and over again until and we are going to be constantly reminded properly about 
ways in which inexplicability is unacceptable. That in the judicial system, for example, I think this is a strong case to say we do not want inexplicable systems. Um, there are going to be accidents. Uber is going to run over another pedestrian, and we sort of know why that one happened in, in Arizona, but it's, we don't know. It was too complex. But we're going to get back in, in the car and let it drive us because fatalities have dropped. I mean, the standard thing to say is 90%. They dropped 50%. We're going to be in the car. The planes land using, using computers. It's fine until they don't. So every time the fact that these things are inexplicable because they screwed up, perhaps, or because they're creating injustice, it's just going to drive home to us that, oh, we're living with and benefiting from machines that we don't understand. That's going to further convince us that the world is chaotic um, because we can benefit from that level of particularity, of refraining when, when necessary from formulating general principles. It's great when you can. But if you can't, it's OK. The stuff is working. I think it may change our attitude towards not just those predictions, mm -hmm. but our understanding of how complex mm -hmm. life is. You know, it, it, starting like in the early 60s, um, uh, I guess late 50s, Silent Spring, we started to understand that there are ecosystems. It was a new notion. The word just goes back a couple of uh, decades before that. But ecosystem, what an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. And the notion that everything is connected, we now live in. We all accept that. We, we understand it. We take it for granted. Um, that's being driven down a level now by this. It's not just the broad sweeps of the course of the rivers. and It's the falling of ash. It's the way a, a leaf skitters down a driveway. These are now all examples of a different world. I'm going to ask one last question and then open it up. And this will be an easier one. Um, uh, <laughs> So, so, you said, so, so you said that the leader just flips a coin in, in, in if, if, if everybody tells oh, the yeah, truth yeah. at the top. Um, I, I think, at least in my organization, everybody hides a little bit of the truth. And by the time it gets to me, there's no truth left. But, but <laughs> it, 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 either way, either zero truth or absolute truth, is leadership overrated? Do we need them anymore? Should we just replace them with a t coin flipper? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> no, it's not what I'm saying. Um, I think it, I, I mean, uh, it is absolutely overrated. Um, it's toxic in many instances. Uh, the gender politics of it by itself should make that clear. Um, uh, and the reaction against leadership has been going on now for, for a long time. And we can certainly trace it back to the hippie era, but mm -hmm. we can go back further. And uh, you know, um, it has a long. Um, history. Uh, we, are both, we both admire and love our leaders and are very, very skeptical and worried about them. Um, so th my point is, no, all decisions ought to be a, a coin toss. It's that decisions should be made. We need more information than ever. Mm -hmm. So rather than reducing, let's see if we can make decisions that um, uh, take advantage of as much information as we can. And there's another part I didn't talk about, but I can be very brief about, which is that, um, behind the idea of strategy. Do you know the phrase, we're going to put all the wood behind the arrow? This is from, uh, what's his name? Scott McNeely, who was uh, CEO of Sun Microsystems, which is a computer company before most of you were born. Oh my god. Um, and he, just talking about strategy, said, we're going to put all the wood behind the arrow, which is a, a phrase that sort of caught on, because it is manly, and it's phallic, and it's, you know, it's, it's just great. So we begin with orgasm, orga, orgasms and end with fallacies, you and me. Sorry, that really didn't come out right. Um, uh, it's a phrase that assumes that strategies, uh, you only get, you have to reduce, it's a zero sum game, and you have to put all of your resources behind the one thing that you choose, which makes it very high risk, of course, but sounds very impressive and you know, doing everything possible. And this whole image, the military image of decision making, is generally entirely inappropriate uh, anywhere except in the military, and maybe not even there. I don't know. Um, there's actually really interesting stuff going on in the military around leadership, which has been really one of the most enlightened groups when it comes to leadership. Um, and it's based upon this zero-sum idea which, uh, that you, know, you only get to choose one direction. Well, yeah, often that's the case. You've got to make those decisions. But also, increasingly now, you can go in multiple cases. You can, you can I don't know, set up an open, an open platform and pursue many possibilities, or let the world pursue the possibilities that, that you can't. You can make more future. And in that situation, leadership is, is not, a, you know, it's not what we used to think it was. It is far more generative. It is more about enabling 
thriving, uh, enabling growth and nourishing, and I'm going to say the sorts of things that you actually do as head of the media lab, where you enable more possibilities. You also do a budget, which requires getting all the wood behind I, a few I'm, arrows. But, I'm, uh, I'm considering changing my title to custodian. That's, I think, actually yeah, what I do. <laughs> yeah, you're, no, you're a gardener. Yeah, I'm a gardener, uh, yeah. Nothing wrong with all being right. a custodian, no. All right. So I want to thank you. I want to open it up now. Uh, we have about, sorry, only about 10 minutes left. But does somebody have a microphone? Somebody have an easy question. So, so Way the, more important. So the person with the microphone oh, picks the And I have a microphone. Microphone. Is it on? OK. Yeah, I think it's on. Yeah. OK. Um, my question is sort of a comment, and I want a response to it. So, and that is that all this data that we're looking at is, is not reality. It's a measurement of reality. And so it's always incomplete. And so making decisions on incomplete data is always um, probabilistic. So I think a lot of what we're dealing with is as life gets more complex, it becomes more probabilistic than deterministic. So there is a determinism in it, but it's not absolute. And one of the things I see with chaos and accepting chaos is that some people accept it and a lot of people don't. Maybe a comparable amount, maybe more, and maybe we end up with people who run countries who don't really believe in chaos, but believe in things that aren't necessarily fact-based. That would never happen. Right. <laughs> so I just wondered, like, I'm just saying it's maybe more complicated than just that. I'm just saying there's still a reality underneath it. I'm a scientist. I'm going to admit that at first. I expect there, I have this faith. I've thought about this a lot, too, because I'm a little bit spiritual about it. But that we have, scientists have faith that there's an explanation underneath everything. And they don't necessarily need to have that explanation all the time. And I see, I've thought about this in the text, context of religion, and what you talked about is about um, indigenous people's beliefs, which are based on their data that they have, and they're sorting it together, but they don't know what's behind it. So it works over a certain time scale, but not necessarily over a different time scale. And I think there's, so there's problems with this moving forward. And yes. it's not straightforward. I mean, we're not, we're not really dealing with it correctly yet. And it's not clear when we think we are, we're probably wrong. So, so what do you think this, about this, that? So um, I'm going to hold it off. I'm going to hold back on talking about spirituality. Right. I'll let, I'll let uh, Joey, do that if you want. But I, I want to thoroughly endorse what you were, the rest of what you were saying. I don't disagree with this, but okay. Um, so data, so I'm going to annoy computer scientists, I think. But data is, uh, is a construct. We decide what we want to measure um, because we think it matters. And we determine how we're going to measure it and what units and how accurate we need it to be. From my point of view, and I, I think that I mean this pretty much literally, information I, I, information is what we read off the dials that we've created to measure the stuff that we care about. And then we go to a machine learning system and we put in the data that we think is relevant. So th there's human touch all around machine learning. It is not just uh, looking out over the universe and gathering data and making its pronouncements. We, if it's diagnostic, uh, software, we're feeding in the stuff that we think matters. And so that's likely to be the normal sorts of stuff that shows up in a hospital record, a medical record, and that seems pretty reasonable. And it very well may not be um, the local environmental conditions in your community, which may turn out to be absolutely, really, really important. Um, these are systems, and then we decide what we want to optimize these systems for. And that's a human decision. How uh, accurate do we insist they be? When are we going to take their advice? Um, how, what, who, who's going to decide what the thing should be optimized for? Who's going to decide um, this, is, this is a useful set of data and this is a set of data that we think probably doesn't obviously contain hideous biases, the hideous biases that human society is heir to? These systems are thoroughly drenched in the human. And so the results that we get are affected by that. 
uh, negatively because we're going to miss some stuff because we didn't realize that uh, some factor is affecting that, that sneakers, shoe size does affect health or whatever. Yeah. Um, there's going to be factors we're going to miss. Uh, you see this, we have to wonder about this for weather, for example. Um, and there are going to be factors that throw things off. These are always more human than I have made them out to, to be. So I'm really glad you, you made your comment. These are probabilistic systems. Absolutely. And machine learning computer scientists, that's, what they deal in, that's all they deal in is probabilities. That's what they want out of it. Um, every answer is probabilistic. 62% chance you're going to get type 2 diabetes in the next five years. I think that is a huge step forward for us, though. If we are able to start thinking, uh, um, asserting with every proposition what we think the probability is, maybe not numerically, of it, then we maybe can talk together better, make more sense out of things together. Because if you don't, you just end up asserting at each other. So I actually really like the probabilistic nature of it. Uh, I'm a, my profession is one that you just identified as a perverter of philosophers. Uh, I'm an econometrician. That was him. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I worry about just the machine learning that is so based in correlation. A, a very simple example. Um, there was an outbreak of flus and a bad epidemic in Russia. And the peasants did a correlation. And they found that the outbreak was the worst where there were the most doctors, because they had been sent by the central authority. They killed all the doctors as a way of curing uh, the influenza. So you. We, we teach our students that, yes, if you merely want to forecast in the short run, throw everything in and you get your correlation, but you do not know causality. You do not know how to change what's going to happen. So without theory, more causa mere causality is, is useless. And I remember one professor is teaching me uh, you know, knowledge without confidence is futile, but confidence without knowledge is, is fatal. Uh, so I, I, I do worry. You can cause chaos by uh, depending on correlation. So, so that's a really important point, and there's, I don't think there's any gainsaying it. Um, so I don't mean to gainsay it, what I'm about to say, which is uh, absolutely. But machine learning is not, generally is not doing those simple correlations. And so it's taking a huge amount of data, not the five things that we think might affect each other, like doctors and measles. It's taking, in, in the case of, so there's a system called Deep Patient that Mount Sinai Hospital did in, in like, I think 2015. It's a deep learning, machine learning thing where they took 700,000 patient records, each of which had 500 data points about, and threw them into a mix. It's deep learning, which means that the, it, it was just numbers. And it found correlations among the numbers without being told ahead of time, these are, these are doctors, these are patients, these are symptoms, these are, um, these are illnesses, these are medicines. Just numbers. It's just numbers. And it found correlations among these millions of data points that enable it to make better, more accurate predictions for some diseases than humans do and to be able to, to predict with some degree, always with some degree of accuracy, um, the onset of diseases that humans simply cannot yet predict. And we don't know why. Right? We don't, in, in some of these instances, we don't know why it thinks, but turns out, statistically, it's, it's probabilistically correct. That's not a case where there's a simple correlation between doctors and measles and go do the stupid, horrible thing. This is a case in which there is so much data, so many data points that it can't be fathomed, but the result is a more likely outcome. But, but I think those edges of explainability is where science will now go to try to create those understandings, right? So I think, I think as an exploratory tool, it's actually quite exciting. And I wouldn't want to give up uh, looking for the causes. I, would, I do not want to give up. So any progress we can make in explicability is good. <laughs> yep. I don't think you were saying that, but I just was just yeah. reinforcing that that edge is very interesting. And, and then please pass the mic to somebody raising their hand if you have the oh. mic. Oh, you have the mic. Okay. Please keep the mic and ask your question. Or Thank you so much. Um, you had mentioned uh, about complexity, and I think you were suggesting that by, uh, by having open systems, you can sort of uh, deal with complexity because you, you're not prescribing something in advance. And um, 
I wanted to sort of talk about um, uh, um, uh, uh, is it possible to explain something which has not caused, right? So if machine learning is using correlation, are we, are we trying to solve the wrong problem, trying to explain something which is directly using correlation? And also, um, to what extent should we seek causality? And, and, um, and so uh, you, you gave the example of the nail, and, um, and you say like it could be the gravity, it could have been avoiding the, uh, the rabbit. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a machine learning system, you would have to sort of collect all that information. And I'm wondering, uh, does trying to find a uh, cause require machine learning to collect so much data? And uh, what, would, what would the implications be of over collecting information in order to find a cause if a cause can be found? Well, that's uh, another. I was asking for softball questions, and you have let me down. Um, so I think that we, so if, if explanations are a tool, and then, by the way, I sort of said this too quickly in the talk, but they're not always tools, but it's a very common sort of explanation is a tool. And if the explanation is somebody says, why do you do this, do this thing? And you say, well, because every time I do it, you know, uh, every time I, I do this, another thing happens and it, and it works. And that's right. Then you've given an explanation. That's the tool the person needed. Why were you doing it? Because in my experience, I don't have a theory, perhaps. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm a child. But it's, you know. But, but I, I, I would just make sure that it's, uh, we clarify the causality piece with the sine qua non, the, 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 the counterfactual, they're slightly different. I think that the counterfactual is an explanation. So, so in the example of the diabetes case, or, um, so Sandra Wachner has a great paper about uh, uh, counterfactuals, but what would be, and to your point with the nail, what you want to know is what was the smallest thing you could change to have changed the outcome. So, so if you are diagnosed with 62% chance of diabetes, what you want to know is what small thing can I change to lower that? So if it said, if you weighed 10% less, your likelihood of diabetes would go below 50%. That's what you want to know. And so yes. I think counterfactual explanations are helpful. They sure. don't explain the underlying theory or even no. maybe the cause, but they may be able to explain something you can do about it. So I think, I think that's uh, slightly different from, from cause. And I think we call this shortest distance. So if you've got all these variables, what you're looking for is for this person, what is the shortest distance change they can do to have changed the outcome? And I think that's a category of explainability that some computer scientists are pushing, um, especially in, in, in law and automated decision making. I think that's... Y yes. And so I'm going to make a, a silly example. Because um, lose 10%, uh, lose, drop 10 pounds, we already have a theory about if that's rela the relation of weight to mm -hmm. diabetes. So let's say um, it's actually... Um, Eat three cornflakes a day. We don't yeah, know why. Yeah, you're right. But people who eat, people who eat a half bowl of cornflakes, yeah. we don't know why. But um, but but and it's got to be post, right, not corn. Right. Not it can't Kellogg's. be if if you're only born Japanese, right? That that's not helpful, right? That's I mean, not so, helpful, right? Because right. you can't change, you can't change it, it, right? It, right. Yeah. Um, and so it may be that uh, eating three eat three raisins a day, um, uh, three cornflakes a day works. Yeah. It's not exact, and that's fine. Good, mm -hmm. do that's that. Useful. That's a yeah. really good thing to know. But it's not exactly what normally we would mean by no, that's, an that's, explanation, that was, right? that was kind of my point. I, 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 yeah. I, I, yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, and that's fine. Then don't eat the cornflakes. But we still don't know exactly why. And it may be that the reason we don't, oh, I'm sorry, I'll give you a harder example in a minute. Um, the reason we don't know why is that the cause of this thing, in this case diabetes, is so enormously com complex. It's like asking what the cause of a war is. And so typically, you know, you get some type of sine qua non, like the Archduke was assassinated. But so many other things had to be in place. Without them, you just have a dead Archduke. You don't have World War I, right? That it's not exactly, we think of, in that case, we think of it as an explanation. We're told in our schools, you know, that was, no, really, really not. We need the economists to help, help us and everybody. We need the geologists to help us. Some things are so deeply caused that even though you can find a sine qua non, a shortest distance thing to do, eat the cornflakes, it's not really an explanation. And so to make this really hard, is one of the, as, as you know, and I think many people here may know, um, there are some, a couple of important papers that say, you know, in a counterfactual case, if you want to know if a system discriminates against women, 
and you didn't get the job because the machine learning said, you know, discarded you, or you didn't get the loan or whatever, then rerun the application and change just one thing, change your gender. And if it comes out differently, mm -hmm. then you know the system is biased. That seems like a pretty good test. It's not exactly, it, it, it's not exactly an explanation. Um, if you really wanted to know why it did that, the fact that that one thing changed is the thing we need to know. It's a nail in the tire. But it's not an explanation of why, why, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. And it may be a, a far more complex than the simple cause. You fixed it, but explanations often are about fixing a problem. That's what they're there for. And if you can do that with three cornflakes, you can do it with, if you can do it with a correlation that you don't understand but seems to work, much of life we've done that, <laughs> you know. Uh, does, uh, does machine learning have to be decentralized by law, lest it sort of the alter, is the alternative too horrible to think of? <laughs> um, so centralized machine learning would be one entity in the world that has all the machine learning, or Google has too much, Facebook has too much, Amazon has too much. OK. Um, so I work part time for Google, disclosure. Um, I'm a writer in residence uh, for a while in the machine learning research group. Um, and I do not speak for Google, next disclaimer. Um, so there's a there's a non a case made outside of politics, which is what your you know political effects and social effects, which is what you're asking about. That says you know if, if you can get machine learning systems to share their results and even perhaps sh uh, share their models, you can start to knit together um, uh, system. You can, you can knit together systems that could give you better predictions. So we have weather systems that have what we think are weather data, but they may not, I don't know, they may not be connected to um, industrial information or et cetera, et cetera. And maybe if you did, you would get better predictions. Um, I don't know enough to be able to tell, tell you what the dangers are of doing that type of um, it's distributed, but it's um, federated uh, systems. I am not entitled to have a, an opinion. Um, I think I would worry more about how any of these centralized owned systems are used, who's making the decisions for at, I'll take Google, why not, who's making decisions about what the machine learning system should be optimized for in the YouTube recommendation engine. Um, which you could be optimized simply to get more people to click and watch more things longer, in which case it, it's very likely to recommend horrible, soul-destroying stuff that is addictive eye candy. And just as with Facebook, it's, if it's optimized for maximum clicks, as it seems to be, because they get you know, their ad money, then that seems to have some pretty bad social effects. For autonomous cars, do we want them op optimized to save uh, for comfort, for to save energy, for faster speed travel, you know, shorter travel times? There are conflicts between these different goals. Who gets to decide? And I, I'm not going to say anything novel when I say I agree with those who say that decisions need to be informed by the people who are affected by them, all of the stakeholders, which is a very large group of people, that those decisions have such large social effects that I, they should not be, be made, at least entirely, by commercial entities. I mean, that's, that, that it seems really clear to me. I do not want the autonomous vehicle makers deciding what their cars are optimized for. Because, for example, they will be very inclined to optimize them to save the lives of the, of the passengers in their car at any expense. And then you get a system that does not minimize the number of fatalities. It just minimizes the number the fatalities of people who can afford BMWs. So there's, I think there's lots of room for regulation um, and for making sure that the decisions are made by the people who, with the input of the people who are affected um, uh, and made with societal interests in mind. I don't have great ideas about how you do that, but I'm really glad that there are lots of people working on this. And how much trouble am I in for this, for saying um, that? Well, I'll, I'll take that part and send it to Larry um, but, <laughs> and, and to Elon. Um, but I think we're out of time. But thank you for being a good sport and the great answers, David. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, George. Thank you, thank you for the wonderful questions. And for